When I was 10 years old, I stayed at home by myself for the first time while my parents went out for a date. I was really into horror movies, so my imagination ran wild, so I had every light on in the house. I was scared, honestly, but not so much due to the lights. My parents told me they would be back by 10, so I wasn't really worried. I had food, blockbuster movies to watch, and my favorite game, Manhunt, on my PS2. By the way, this was 2004. It started to get dark outside, when all of a sudden a storm hit. Then the lights went out. As soon as it happened, I ran into our living room near the front of the house with my flashlight. I was definitely afraid now. I decided to get under the covers on the couch. I tried to fall asleep, but I was so afraid I couldn't. I don't know why, but I peeked out from under the covers, and I swear, I saw the silhouette of a man in the corner of the room. I jumped back under my covers, breathing heavily. Then all I heard was slow, methodical footsteps. They were coming toward me. Then I heard whispering along with the footsteps. My heart was pumping out of my chest at this point. Then the sound stopped. I just laid there frozen. No sound. Go! I got up and ran out of the house because it felt like someone touched my arm. And I know I heard someone yell the word go. I pretty much ran out of the house with the blanket over my head. I ran to my neighbor's house. I told them what happened and they called the cops from their cell phones. My parents arrived a little later than they expected due to bad traffic. They seemed angry about what happened. The police say that there was no evidence of a break-in. I still to this day remember that feeling of fear, but I really don't know if it were my imagination or not. This is a story that didn't happen to me. It happened to my dad. It's not a scary story about a creepy encounter with someone or anything paranormal. It's more of a close call kind of story. Anyway, in 2001, he was working for a big company, a good paying job. I'm not sure how long he worked there since I was three years old at the time. He got laid off on September 9th, 2001, two days before 9-11. On the morning of 9-11, he's still asleep and gets a call from my grandfather saying, those raghead terrorists, I'm going to kill all of them. He asked him why the hell he was yelling and cussing into the phone at 8 a.m. My grandfather tells him to turn on the TV and check out the news. Well, you know the rest. Two planes crash into the World Trade Center. This part I actually remember seeing on TV. Of course, being three years old, I had no idea what was going on. Now here's some creepy stuff for the story. After the towers collapse, my dad gets a call from his boss. He asks him, James, what the hell just happened? There was a loud explosion and everyone started freaking out. I'm still in the tower and it's really dark in here. My dad tells him the towers are gone, they collapse. I'm not really sure how their conversation went after this, but eventually his boss's phone cut off. He somehow survived the collapse by being trapped in an air bubble or something like that, I don't know. He got trapped under all the debris and was stuck in the air bubble. No idea how he got signal on his phone underneath all of that. His body was never found. Now the main reason I'm sharing this story is because a few years ago, my dad told me something that is chilling to think about. Right before he was laid off, he was scheduled to go to a meeting with his boss and some other people he worked with. The meeting took place on the 72nd floor of the North Tower. It was supposed to start exactly at 8 a.m. Coincidence or not, this is creepy. I'm glad he never went to go to that meeting. I only have a few early childhood memories from 2001, so I almost grew up without a father. Now it's just something our family talks about every now and then. 
This just in, you were looking at a, obviously a very disturbing live shot there. That is the World Trade Center, and we have unconfirmed reports this morning that a plane has crashed into one of the towers of the World Trade Center. CNN Center right now is just beginning to work on this story, obviously calling our sources and trying to figure out exactly what happened, but clearly something relatively devastating happening this morning there on the south end of the island of Manhattan. That is, once again, a picture of one of the towers of the World Trade Center. I'm 26 years old, and this story happened about five months ago. One night I woke up at around 1 a.m. and I couldn't go back to sleep. Usually when this happens, I go on my laptop and I go on social media or I watch YouTube. I got pretty bored after a while and then remember my friend telling me about the deep web and even worse, the dark web. I thought it's the perfect time to check it out. When I go on there, there was a lot of links to click on such as live rape, illegal pornography, hit men for hire, human body parts for sale, torture, all kinds of stuff. I click one link that said home invasion live stream. The first thing I saw upon clicking was a man filming himself. He was wearing a clown mask and held up a large knife imitating slicing his own throat. He then turned the camera around to film a window that was slightly open. He took his shoes off and slowly slid the window open and climbed inside. You could see him sneaking upstairs. He entered the bathroom where he made a small cut on his arm with the knife he was carrying. He got all the toothbrushes and rubbed them in his open wound and put them back how he found them. I didn't really feel comfortable watching this. But after seeing that I was disgusted, I couldn't click away. I was too enticed by this and what he was doing, so I kept watching. He then opened the door to a bedroom where a man and a woman were sleeping. He leaned over to the man, put his hands right next to his face, almost touching him. Then the same again with the blade that he was carrying. He pressed the knife right up to his throat, almost making contact. The masked man then went and stood right next to the woman on her side of the bed and stood there just staring at her, just watching her breathe as she slept. After just standing there, he pulled something out of his pocket and placed it next to the woman's pillow. I couldn't see what it was, but then he zoomed in. It was a note with the words, I could have raped and killed your whole family, written on it. He then snuck out of the bedroom, and I said out loud, this guy is so fucked up. He paused, and he turned the camera onto himself and just stared at it. I thought, that's weird. It's like he heard me say that. He was still staring at the camera, in fact. It was like he was staring at me. After a short pause, he carried on sneaking around downstairs and quietly climbed out the window, and the stream ended. At that point, I also had enough for one night and decided to try and sleep. I never told anyone that I went on the deep web. And about three weeks after watching that live stream, I woke up one morning to see a note next to my pillow and it read, so who's fucked up now? Yeah, I was scared. But I didn't tell anybody because it, it sounds fake. But I tell you what, I will never go back on the deep or the dark web again. This story happened to me on my first day of high school. I remember walking down my street in the morning toward the bus stop. There were a few other kids that stood next to me talking. There was also a man who definitely didn't belong at a high school bus stop. He was tall, had a shaved head, a mustache, and a white tank top on. I thought he looked weird and out of place, but I really didn't give it a second thought. My first day of high school actually went fine. It was on the way home where it all went wrong. I got on the school bus. And as I was walking to find my seat, I saw this same man from this morning set on the back of the bus. This time, he was staring right at me. I didn't know then, 
And I still don't know now how this guy even got on the bus in the first place. The house I lived in was one of the last stops, so by the time my stop arrived, most of the kids have gotten off the bus, and the bus was empty. I could just feel that guy staring at me the whole bus ride home, though I didn't dare to look behind me and check. When my stop finally arrived, I got off and I started walking. And of course, that creepy man got off and started following me. I started walking faster. And as I did, the man got faster. And that continued right down my street. The faster I walked, the faster he would. It got to the point where I needed to start running. Thankfully, my house was close by. I ran by my house and slammed the door shut. And I looked through the kitchen window to see if the man was still chasing me. He was walking past my house like nothing ever happened while staring at me. Later that night, I was upstairs in my bedroom when someone knocked at the door, the downstairs door. The next thing I heard was my mom calling me downstairs. When I get there, my mom is looking confused and checking around outside. I say to her, yeah, mom. She said, that's weird. There was a man just here asking to speak to you. I asked what he looked like, and she described the same man who chased me home earlier that day. I told my mom about what happened and how I was pretty sure it was the same guy who knocked at the door. My mother told the police and our school. And actually, this wasn't the first time they have heard reports of this. The school and the police said they had several reports of the man stalking their children. From what I know, he was never caught. Who knows what he could be doing right now? Just be careful. This happened a while ago. Me and my brother, Ron, were in my room watching football, screaming at the screen when our team would do something idiotic. We were about 40 minutes into the game. Ron slammed his fist into the remote, turning the television off by accident. I turned the TV back on, and as the screen loaded back up, we heard footsteps coming from downstairs. Ron and I quickly turned our heads to the bedroom door. I turned down the volume to hear the noises clearer. I think someone's inside, Ron said. I could hear the shudder in his voice. He was anxious. No, it's probably just the dog, I responded. Ron, however, was a lot more cautious. He walked over to the bedroom door and locked it. The click it made alerted the intruder. We heard even more footsteps. Ron then whispered, That's not the dog. Ron acting nervous put me on edge. So I agreed with him and turned off the bedroom lights. Ron then looked around the room, trying to find some sort of object we could use as a weapon. I sat next to the door, with my ear placed on our wall. They were so thin that if there was someone inside the house, I would be able to hear them. Nothing happened at first. It was just dead silence. Take a look, Ron said. He had his phone turned on in case we needed to call the police. I lay on my chest and looked through the gap under the bedroom door. I saw blackness, but I could barely make out a pair of boots standing a little ways down the upstairs hall. I felt both hands shaking as I pushed myself back up to my feet. I tiptoed over to Ron, who was waiting anxiously for the answer. Someone's here, I whispered as low as I could. Ron's face went pale as he stared into nothingness. At one point, I thought he was going to black out on me. I pulled Ron over to our window. I quietly opened the window and looked down at the grass, two stories below my current position. Ron was still in a different world, as if he was blocking himself out from reality, leaving the responsibility to me. I tried not to pay much attention to him and instead focused on escaping. I took Ron's phone out of his hand as he crouched on the carpet. He had installed one of those apps where specific fingerprints can enter the phone. I took his hand which was shockingly freezing, and held his index finger on the phone screen. I jumped out of my skin when the phone let out a loud beep, and all of a sudden, I could hear footsteps running straight to the bedroom door. 
I quickly typed in 911 and put one leg out of the window. I heard loud banging on the bedroom door and shouting, I'm going to kill you. I landed on the porch roof and shouted at Ron to snap back into action. Ron stood up quickly and stumbled outside of the window. He landed on the roof beside me as I forced the window shut again. We need to jump, I said. I could hear faint thumping behind the walls. The intruder was struggling to get inside our room. I jumped off the porch roof and sprang to my ankle. Ron was wobbling on the edge of the roof. Quick, I said. I avoided shouting as whoever the intruder was would have known that we were outside. Ron touched his chest, head, right shoulder, and left shoulder, making a cross before he jumped. We were a good six blocks away before I realized that I had left my dog behind. I burst into tears from fear of what just happened and worrying if my dog was hurt. I talked to the police operator as both me and Ron slowly walked back to the house. We heard sirens and I felt the weight lift off our shoulders. As we approached our house, we noticed that the police were now outside. Me and Ron hid beside our porch. Both of us were waiting to come face to face with the intruder. Four cops came out, but there was no man, and one of them was holding my dog Lewis. I hugged him and apologized to him for leaving him behind. The cops explained that there was no one inside, and there was nothing stolen either. In fact, they explained that there was nothing to even prove that someone had invaded our property. They never found him. Ron installed some CCTV cameras in both of our houses, but I can assure you, I haven't had a good night's sleep since.